Hold on. What about now? Can we, everybody hear us? Can you guys hear us now? My mic is muted. Yeah, Tony's mic is muted on the right. top. No, of no, the that's good. We want your mic muted. It's fine. Oh, so I'm good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're as good. As long as people can hear us. The red light. They can. like to have comments if they could hear us on the comments section. There's still no sound. There's no sound? Okay. You All got right. sound? Do you guys hear us now? Let us know in the comments. Yeah, I think we can hear us now. We've got to make sure okay. they can hear us. All right, very good. They can hear us. Okay, so. Uh, I, I just, why don't you introduce Rick again? Yeah, yeah. Rick again. I'm going to introduce Rick Clark. You can see Rick on the bottom left-hand side of your screen. Rick has been with the New England Society for Psychic Research since about 1992 or three when he started to attend. He and Jimmy Petnito, which a lot of you guys know, Mr. Haunted, he attended the classes of Ed Lorraine Warren, and that's where I met Rick. Rick was only, what, 30 years old back then, 29 or something yeah, like that? Yeah, 20s, actually. Yeah. In his 20s, yeah. and they were very dedicated to – psychic research and psychic investigations but rick uh is very knowledgeable so is jimmy so is dan and chris but rick is one of our first uh regular nespr members and he's still with us and we're introducing him tonight so rick if you want to say hello to the audience and, uh, and if you want to just tell us how you first met ed lorraine i actually met them with jimmy petnito and we attended a class yeah and i just became friends with her instantly. Actually. Fascinated, right? Yeah, and Lorraine kind of took me under her wing, and they invited us into these investigations, and we just kept at it. And Ed was hammering us with knowledge about what's yeah. happening at Grinnell. Yeah, and, and you, you hammered him with questions too, right? I asked Ed every question possible. I was never afraid to ask him a question, and he was very honest with me with the answers. Right. And, um, so it's, and you've had your share of psychic experiences yourself, too. Some things that's hard to explain. Uh, you were course. telling me the thing like with the yellow motorcycle or scooter, scooter when you drove by. Why don't you well, quickly tell story. the audience that story? It's great. It's a wild story, but it shows you that there's no coincidence. And you don't always know that it's psychic when it's happening. I, think and, no. uh, I was a kid. I was about a teenager and I had a yellow scooter. And um, it was raining out. I was at the beach. and I was driving it home. And it died from the rain. And it stopped in front of this house. And these two kids came out. One was my age and one was a little bit younger, John and Steve. And they helped me get the scooter going. And we became best friends. I mean, for ever. We were best friends. And eventually, they moved away. And they moved <laughs> to Florida. And I kind of lost contact like a lot of people do when you move away. And one day, I was at the beach in my Jeep now. And it started raining. So I was driving home, went by their house, and I saw in front of their house a yellow scooter with these three kids working on it. And I thought that was hysterical that this was happening. And that's exactly how I met these guys. So I went home. How many years later? Was it was 12 years. 12 years, 12 years, 12 years later. later. After they moved away. Right. I haven't heard from them in 12 years. Okay. And I um, went home. And I just had this urge to call them, find their numbers, mm -hmm. went on Google. I found their numbers and realized they would move back to Connecticut. So I call up, called John, who was my age. And you got home. You and I got home yeah. instantly. And I left a message on his machine. And I said, John, this is Rick. I know we haven't spoken in a while, but I saw something really strange. You have to call me. It's incredible. And I hung up. Then I said, let me call Steve, mm -hmm. his brother. Call Steve. And Steve answered the phone. I said, Steve, this is Rick. He said, you heard about John? And mm -hmm. I said, why? What's up with John? And he goes, John died an hour ago, cancer and hospice. Oh, wow. Yeah, 12 years. Killed, killed, killed I, called him, yeah. I called him an hour to when he died. 12 years went by. I called him to an hour because I saw that on the side of the road. And it dawned on me um, at the funeral, his mom said to me, I heard the messenger left, John, what did you see? When I started telling her what I saw, it hit me. Oh my God, what did I see? Did I see us 12, you know, yeah. years earlier? I think you did. And did he make me see this? I called him an hour, 12 years went by to when he died. And it was, if I called him instantly, I would have been calling him right when he died. Isn't that crazy? It's, I couldn't understand it. And I think I told you. You, you did tell me. You kind of put it more in perspective to me. What I saw is possibly he made me see this. He made you see it because he and wanted you to know that he was now in the spirit realm. Yes. But you know, he wanted you as good friends right. to know. 
right. to know that happened. And the coincidence, it wasn't a coincidence. It was just a, too outrageous to be a coincidence. Right. I mean, yeah, that was a coincidence. That's 12 one years of, to be out when, when you die is insane. Yeah, that's one in a trillion chance right. of being a coincidence. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yes. Well, that's that's super. I, I love that story, you know. It's, it's You know why I love it? Because it shows that there's an afterlife. Right. And right. guys, what we're here today, I mean, Lorraine had a uh, dessert. Yesterday was our anniversary for passing, so yeah. we want to dedicate this show today um, about the rain, and uh, and then we have a special guest coming in um, in about five minutes, uh, Christina Rowan from uh, Gettysburg, and we'll talk about her a little bit more. But I want to talk about uh, Lorraine a little bit more. When's the first time you met Lorraine, dude? Uh, first time I met Lorraine was in 2000, 2010? 2010, around there, 2011. Um, actually, I, I met you and Lorraine at a lecture in uh Shelton, mm -hmm. and um, I was standing outside, and uh, I forgot who was with me, I think it was Rich was with me to Carlo. And um, I asked if uh, you guys needed any help, and you threw a box of books yes, at me. I and uh, I, I never wanted to be curious, that, that, that sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Lorraine, <laughs> Lorraine says, Take these books inside, <laughs> sweetie. <laughs> And uh, so, <laughs> and I believe Lorraine just had a hip operation. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. That, she, during yeah. that time, she right. just recently had one. So I was trying to say, Lorraine, you need a hand going in. She was like, she pushed my hand away. She says, no, I, you know, I got it. I got this. She, she not, she didn't want nobody she's to know that she, lady, she was, lady. you know, just said she just had an operation and yeah. she was weak, but she wasn't weak. She's strong. Yeah. But so you carry Tony's books, so that's but yeah, yeah, I carry Tony's books. Or did she? Well, actually, Lorraine's books. Yeah. Lorraine <laughs> was like, you know, make sure you sell these books, you know. Those are my books. <laughs> but um, yeah, that was the first time um I was with you guys, and ever since then, I uh, you and you know, showed up at a Warrenology. Warrenology. I remember meeting out in the, uh, right outside the house and on the on the street, right? And Chris was there with you, and he started talking to me, and I started. I saw you're a cop, huh, Chris? He was yeah, and I, said, I was a cop too, and. And I said, where are your cop? He told me. And so we instantaneously got like a, a good rapport. Right. Almost, almost mm -hmm. immediately. Uh, so, and Lorraine always, always liked Dan and Chris and Rick, especially Rick too. Mm -hmm. She loved Rick. And, you know, I used to say to Lorraine, I said to Lorraine, mm -hmm. Rick, uh, you like Rick better than me? <laughs> she's, she's, like, she's like, oh, huh, nah, nah. Well, How did you meet Laura? And sir, when you I, first met them, I what did you them. think in your head when you first met them? When I first met them, I met them in 1979, right. October, at the Jorgensen Auditorium in, in UConn, University of Connecticut. And of course, I'm married to Judy. Right. And, and, were you married at the time? Or were you no, just, this is the first I just, time you I just started dating. Right. I, I knew her for about three weeks. And she said, you want to go see my folks who lecture at UConn? And I looked at her. I said, "They're lecturing at UConn." Did you know who, but who no. they were? She said, "Yeah." I go, oh, "What are they? College professors?" And she laughed. She said, "No, they're not college professors. They're not teachers or anything. They're they're ghost hunters." She said, "Psychic researchers." And I said, "Who are they?" She said, "The Warrens, Ed and Lorraine Warren." Have you ever heard of them? And I said, "That sounds really familiar." Like I, because I, I used to be into astrology and stuff, and astronomy and astrology, reading uh, zodiacs and all that. <clears throat> so. We went there, and she said, they're in the green room at Jorgensen. So we go walk into the green room. There's Ed sitting with his suit, and he had a vested suit and a nice handkerchief coming out of his pocket, out of a suit. And he's looking at his slides. He had a slide projector. That's how, how he did his presentations, with a slide projector on a projector screen. And remember, the Jorgensen holds like 2,000 people. Right. But Ed, he knew how to do it with his projector. So... He's looking through the slides up at the light. He's looking at the light like this. He looks at me and he looks back. This slides, he looks, he goes, How you doing, kid? You believe in ghosts? Just like that. Mm -hmm. And I said, Well, and I was a wise guy back then. I said, Yeah, well, I believe yeah. in Casper. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so he started laughing. He goes, Well, after tonight, you'll you're gonna change your tune, kid. He goes, You wait till you hear my uh, lecture. And then Lorraine's sipping tea. She had a kilt, uh, Scottish tilt, kilt down with a white ruffled blouse and uh, like a some kind of a tartan scarf and she looks up from her teeth hi honey That's she's right. always honey hi hey, how are you because you know judy told her my name and everything i said oh i'm doing well i'm very 
pleased to meet you. So, so why don't you guys go sit? We've got seats for you in the front row. Go watch the show. We'll be out. We're going to come out in 10 minutes. So we watched the show. I was like, I, and I was a cop, remember, at that time. I was getting, like, scared. <laughs> you know, stuff was down your spine. Yeah. Right? Like, he's showing the Annabelle down. He's talking about devils and possessions. And you're probably wondering what you got yourself into. I'm saying, I'm saying, I'm like, what, yeah. what, what am I doing here? I'm looking over at Judy. She's staring at the screen. And then he got these voices going on his uh, recorder, these spirit voices. I'm like shocked at the end of the thing. Like, what the heck mm -hmm. did I just watch for two hours? Yeah. And then she says, "Come on, if they're done. Let's go. To, let's go in the uh, green room and you know, talk to them, say goodbye." And Ed's like, "Let's go get a pizza." He always wanted to eat. Yeah, you know what? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Either get a pizza or a cheeseburger. So we found a pizza place at. In stores, Connecticut, if anybody knows stores, it's dead at night. It's a small, small town, rural. We found a place open. It must have been about 1030. So we're sitting there, and we met Ed Lorraine there because we had our own car. And there's a guy sitting with Ed with a yellow notepad, a legal pad. He's writing when I walked in. And Ed's sitting there. And I start talking to Ed Lorraine. Mr. Warren, that was great. Oh, call me Ed. Call me Ed. All right, Ed. Ed, so tell me more about the devil. So, so he starts talking, right? And and uh, he gets interrupted by this guy stand, sitting next to him with a yellow pad. He said, Ed, can I ask you about, I'm, I'm Amityville now, Ed. And Ed looks over at him. He goes, Gerald, you're a real pain in the ass. You know that? We're trying to have pizza here. It was Gerald Brill wow. who wrote The Demonologist. Yeah. He was writing the book right then. We, we met, I didn't know the guy. He was like a couple years older than me. And I felt bad because he turned all red and he's looking down. Because he said, you're a real pain in the ass. You know that? Because that didn't, he didn't pull punches, as you know. Yeah, and people don't realize that. He so, did not pull punches. No, at all. So that's that's how I met him. And uh, it was it was, it was was fantastic. Hey, guys, we got one minute before we uh, add our guest. But uh, any closing um, comments or anything on well, Lorraine? Uh, uh, I just like to say that, like they say that we're, we're happy to be able to, to continue the tradition of Ed and Lorraine Warren because – the thing about Ed and Lorraine, they really wanted to help everybody as much as they possibly could, and they never took compensation. Right. People say, well, they were in it for the money. No, BS. They, right. they never charged for their uh, services. If somebody said, can you come out to Ohio, Ed, and we'll give you gas money, we'll pay. He would take the gas money. He's right. not stupid. Right. Right. Because it's it. costing him money. Right. Uh, but he would never ask for money. And he would say, if you take a cent, I will break your fingers. Yeah, That's don't take any money. Yeah. Because that, you know, yeah. you lose all credibility. Right, right. Like these yeah. psychics who say, I'm psychic. I know all about you, but I need 600 bucks first. Right. Come on. Right. You know, when if you really want to help somebody, just help them. When people yeah. said they took money, they did. And I'll tell you right up front, they did not. And I've been there, experienced it. And that was the thing he would say, you don't take a cent. Right, because you lose all credit. Right, now, right. Now, the second you take the money, well, he you said, will say you're in it for the money. And we're there to help people. Right. He said, "That's right. what he would say. We're here to help." And that lives in a haunted house. house. Yeah. All right, guys. Um, we're gonna go back uh, before the show ends, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about Ed and Lorraine. Um, but right now, I want you guys uh, to meet our first guest, actually, uh, here on uh, Secrets of the Supernatural podcast. Christina Rowan, marketing manager at Gettysburg Battlefield Bus Tours and tour manager guide at Ghostly Images of Gettysburg Tours, Jenny Wade House and the Orphanage. So right now I'm going to add uh, Christine to the podcast and let's welcome Christine. Hello, everyone. Hi. Greetings from Gettysburg. Hi. So Christine, uh, Tony Sparrow here. Uh, welcome. I'm just meeting you for the first time tonight, but, but but Dan and Chris and Wade already met you. And they said what a lovely person you are. Uh, Thank we'd like you. To say, uh, what exactly do you do down in Gettysburg, and what's it all about? What you do with the uh, tours and everything? Yeah, how did it all start for you? Well, how did the Gettysburg portion of my life begin? Yes. Well, anything you want to tell us? You did Gettysburg, the beginning, <laughs> whatever. Yes. Whatever my love of Gettysburg began at age five when I was wow. brought here by my parents. Mm -hmm. yep. And of course I talked them into returning numerous times that flowed into adulthood mm -hmm. um, and coming here my whole life, uh, several times a year. 
began about 30 years ago, uh, ghost hunting mm -hmm. all around town. And of course, it is the stance of the National Park Service that there are no hauntings on this battlefield. So mm -hmm. I can't officially say that I was ghost hunting on the battlefield, but, um, you know, you can kind of imply that we were looking. Right. Were you with so, a team or, or you were just, you know, on your own? Strictly amateur. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes. So taking pictures with the, an old Absolutely. An old camera. Yes. <laughs> the film camera probably. probably film Digital camera. camera. Okay. Um, oh, way they back. Yes. Yes. Do you know you can catch a lot of really interesting orbs on a Polaroid? Believe it or not. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sometimes See, the old technology is better. Exactly. Totally agree. Tell how the national park and generally the the attitude of the the town has changed towards the openness of of ghost research, ghost hunting and now goes tours over the past two decades. Yeah. Oh. How the two mingle. National Park. Absolutely not. There are no ghost tours allowed on any National Park property. Again, the official stance is there are no hauntings here. Right. As far as the town, that is completely different. I was made aware that on search engines, if you Google Gettysburg, 50% of people are Googling for history. The other 50% paranormal. What does that tell you? Mm -hmm. This is you're sitting right behind me is East Cemetery Hill, the high ground of this battle. This was the bloodiest battle ever fought on American soil. We're in the most famous small town in America. How long did that battle last? Three, Three days, days, July Three 1st, days. 2nd, and 3rd of 1863. And how many uh, casualties. casualties during that war, during that time? 52,000 casualties, That's missing, huge. wounded, dead. Are you kidding me? 52,000? And, and I heard by the high water mark, the blood was so thick it, it was... Uh, ran two and a half inches on the battlefield. You are correct. And what will happen here? It, because now it's all so lovely and manicured and it's, it's mm -hmm. beautiful here. Right. This says it perfectly. What will go on here over those three days and then into the aftermath for the 2,400 civilians that live here is far more gruesome than any horror movie you will ever watch. I can imagine. 160,000 troops are going to descend on this small population, bringing with them approximately 80,000 horses and mules. All around, and I know you gentlemen were recently here, this lovely town and these fields, they will be littered with the bodies of over 10,000 dead men. Another few thousand dead horses and mules. People tend to forget it's July. Doesn't bode well for these dead bodies. Right. They had to be hastily buried. There was absolutely no time to bury them at a proper depth of six feet. The average grave will be 12 inches. Wow. And uh, in the heat too, I mean, wow. right? I mean, on top oh, yeah. of that with the bodies uh, decomposing, I think it was like 90. Uh, you mean bloating and exploding. Right. 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 Uh, the stories yeah. I know, I, I really choose not to tell. They are out there. The horror. Um the wild dogs, the wild boars, you can just let your imagination run wild. What was going on? All water supplies will be spoiled. So the civilians actually had water brought in by the U.S. Sanitary Commission. The stench was yeah. so horrific. 
I can't, I can't even imagine. Remember, no air conditioning. They couldn't even open their windows. If you wanted to go outside, you would put peppermint oil or lavender oil on a handkerchief, cover your face just to be able to move about this town. When President Lincoln comes in November to give the Gettysburg Address to the National Cemetery, which is also over my left shoulder, there will still be a slight stench of death. When he was giving a speech, weren't the bodies still in front of him? I mean, like 12 inches, some of the bodies were still there? Uh, actually, the... Uh, National Cemetery was for the Union soldiers. Okay. The Confederates will remain in this ground for almost 10 years. Wow. That's until a women's organization in the South was able to raise enough money to rent several train cars. They will come here, try to gather the remains. They will return and of course, there is a large crowd of people at the depot waiting to hopefully find their loved ones. They will return with less than one train car filled with remains. So the why of Gettysburg is pretty simple. To this very day, we know there are approximately eight to 12 hundred bodies still right under our feet here. And that is a fact per the park service. Wow. Wow. Boy. And if you think that doesn't cause a haunting, you know, many cultures believe if you are not buried in consecrated ground, this is exactly what will happen. I'm curious, Christine, in the town's opinion and its history, um, uh, when did uh, the paranormal activity, the hauntings, did they start in the past uh, 30 years? Or did they actually happen 5, 10 years after the battle? Oh, it gets better than that. And thank you for that question. I don't know if you were aware of this. Uh, Joshua Chamberlain yes. will write about it in his, his memoirs. Mm -hmm. Union Soldiers will report several sightings of a very famous son of Pennsylvania, none other than George Washington. One of the famous sightings will occur at the Lutheran Seminary. It's yes. day one. The battle's getting ready to begin in earnest. Suddenly, they see a man on a white horse. He's wearing a uniform that doesn't look like theirs and a very strange looking hat. Hmm. He's taking his sword and making the motion to charge. Wow. Well, somebody finally realized that was a tricorn hat. And the white horse, as you know, Washington rode a white horse. The belief right. is this son of Pennsylvania had returned to rally these troops because he knew what was going to happen on these fields. And again, this will be reported time and time again. Right. The oldest story of a haunting will begin almost immediately after the battle. The first day's battle, something will occur. Albert Iverson will be leading his brigade of North Carolinians. As they are crossing an open field, suddenly a Union Brigade will rise up from behind a stone wall and open fire. Iverson's men were in a very tight formation. 900 of them will be killed. Wow. It is said, and this is truth, they will fall. And they will be laying there in perfect formation. Wow. Just to say, these men will also be buried in shallow graves. Later, they will be recovered. However, 
This wasn't National Park Service land. This was a farmer's field. Right. Immediately after the battle, they begin seeing strange things in this field. His field hands refused to be anywhere near that field after sunset. To this very day, it is known in a very wow. little known spot only by ghost hunters as the most active spot on this field. Now, because, now, mm -hmm. yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Now, you often see shadowy apparitions. I, Iverson will say that his men just showed complete bravery. Nobody retreated. That is not what the remaining men will say. They said it was absolutely horrific because it's the men in front of them are being killed. You know, they're being splattered with blood. Yes, some will actually lay on the ground, wave their white handkerchiefs. You can still see what looks like hundreds of handkerchiefs Waving in that field, Amazing. mist will just appear in that field. That's insane. So yes, definitely now, very interesting. Now I know you guys run the bus tours, the uh, ghostly images of Gettysburg tours. There's a yes. bus, tours, right? Now you can see all this stuff on on the bus tours, correct? We do not. Again, that's. You have to be very careful because that is an area that we cannot access. As a matter of fact, I am the ghost hostess for the bus tour. It's called our haunted bus. We do take you through the countryside, but not on National Park Service roads. Right, right. right. Um, Sax Bridge. Sax Bridge. I was going to talk about. Yes, we do go there. Sax Bridge is interesting because the Union will come in across Sax Bridge to Gettysburg, but the Confederates will retreat across Sax Bridge. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I remember, I remember Bridge um, just walking there, and my friend had uh, her digital recorder running. I didn't even know she had it running. Uh, and uh, she plays back the recorder and it sounded like a little girl following us. And uh, there was a group of people investigating at the other end of the bridge. And you hear the little girl saying, mommy and daddy don't like that. And, uh, and she continued to follow. So once we heard that, we kept the recorder running. And as we were going down the, uh, the, the water embankment there, walking down there and Karen's son was running and you hear the little girl saying, why is he running? So it was amazing just, you know, to have a spirit of a little girl communicating with you when you're not even communicating with her. Um, I thought that was really right. interesting. But there's yep. another bridge as well is a uh, suicide bridge. Correct. A little bit now, of suicide bridge. Yes. Now, Dan, as far as the little girl, and no, I'm not just saying this. Yes. Mm -hmm. A little girl is constantly picked up on that bridge. Have no idea why she's there, um, what time period, you know, she is from. But yes, that is frequently. We do hear her voice. Uh, people sense her and so on. Right. The suicide bridge. Um, you do have a lot of myths and I love love to be a myth buster. It is the Eisenhower Bridge. Uh, Suicide Bridge, I find that very interesting. It's mm -hmm. 10 feet above the water. Uh, go ahead and right. jump off of a 10-foot bridge. You may break your leg if you're lucky. This story allegedly, and I do not have anything to prove this, it was after World War II. There was a woman pushing a baby carriage across that bridge. A car comes across much too fast. The mother scurries to get off to the side. The carriage tips, goes in the water. The mother cannot swim. However, she does 
Uh, Christina, you're freezing up a little yeah, bit there. Was. I think. Uh, yeah, and the baby will both perish right there. That oh, is what I think really brings on what happens at the Eisenhower Bridge. Suicides, yeah. nothing I have seen has ever happened there. Yeah, yeah, we were there probably around eight months ago, and uh, we got the Chris, yeah, we Chris, got myself, and Wade, and uh, a bunch of other people were, were there around, what, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning? It was, yeah, it was early. And Chris could tell you the story. Um, on the darkness, this old man <laughs> appears on a bike. An old bike. An like old, old bike at like that. Huh? I mean, like from and the 1950s or something. Pitch dark. Right. Pitch dark. He, I mean, he just came out of nowhere. And yeah, Chris could tell you the rest of the story on, on that one. What happened? Well, we were we were on the bridge and we were talking about uh, oh, we were talking about paranormal the, activity, paranormal yeah. activity, and somebody mentioned something about, about a grandfather, a grandfather, a little boy, a boy that uh, killed himself. Or, I think he was like thirteen years old. Whatever. That, this is that, what we heard. That that was what the, the the people were telling us that we were with at the time. Whether it was true or not, I don't know. Um, but it, we were talking about and that it was the grandfather's property, and then out of out of the darkness, this uh, this fellow just just shows up on this bicycle. Just I don't know how he snuck up on us, but he comes up right behind us. Just, old man, long white long beard, white old, beard. old bike from like the fifties, right, right. two o'clock in the morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Like, I, I didn't really and, know. And he he uh, scared the hell out of us. He scared the hell out of us, but he <laughs> said hello, he said hello back. We had a short conversation. Yes. Go ahead. I don't want to interrupt. But. And then, uh, and then we, you know, we spoke for a few minutes. He was and very we, nice. we mentioned about the little boy, about the boy. Yeah. yeah. And he did say that that was his nephew. Like a nephew. Yeah, it was a nephew or something. that had uh, killed himself. And um, and then he drives right by us, and like he pedals by us, and and he, he, some of us wanted to just touch him to see if he was real because it was creepy. But, and then he he just pedaled across the bridge. Into the darkness. And he went into us. And he went into the complete darkness. Right. And then, I'm sorry, Chris, about 12 seconds later, we all went away. And I had a big, huge flashlight, a mag light, and I shined it. We shined it 500 feet down the road. He wasn't there. He wasn't there. He disappeared. He disappeared. He disappeared. I mean, he was, I mean, he wasn't on that dark path going home, so to speak, right. more than 12 seconds. Right. And I, I finally said, whoa, 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 let's just shine a light so he can yeah. see. Right. And nothing. But it, it was just weird. Who knows? He probably lived at the house at the end of that road over there. Maybe. Maybe. How yeah. he uh, Dan, he does. Okay. As a matter of fact, I'm not going to divulge his name, but yes, he scares people all the time. <laughs> oh, I scare a lot of people go out there. Um, as a matter of fact, Tom and I were just discussing maybe with the haunted bus also going to that bridge. He comes and talks to people. He loves okay. to come out at like three yeah. o'clock in the morning. Three o'clock in the morning. Perfect. He does. He lives there. He'll a come and converse, scare you to death. Son of a bitch. Yes. He's a real guy. He's still there. He wasn't a ghost. Stay. We can go out when you're in town and he'll be there. All right. Clearing that up. Huh? Yes. Wait, now I know. I, I, next time I go there, I'm probably going to scare the shit out of him. Then. Yeah. <laughs> we'll be waiting for him. That's yes. Right. I have a question for Stay you. Back's a bitch. For your opinion, Christine. <laughs> How much of the paranormal activity do you think is actual spirit contact activity or residual energies, say, such pounded into the ground? from all the cannons, et cetera, et cetera, and all that force? That is a great question because there's some different theories about what's going on here. And is it residual or is it intelligent? It's both. Uh, one of the theories is that the residual haunting is because, remember, the soldiers were very young. They had a lot of in unfinished business. Mm -hmm. um, they never meant to come and fight and die here, but they did. This was so traumatic. So it, it's like a movie that plays over and over and over. That's why we see the Phantom Regiments. We really do 
I have heard living here, the phantom cannons firing. We We've hear. heard that. We've heard so, that. Yes. Really? People yeah. think you're crazy when you say it. No. We'll sit out there and go, oh, there's the phantom cannon fire. But Green is that are not firing. Well, is wow. that is that just vibrational echoes, memories locked into the ground, say the quartz the minerals? Or yes. is it or is it actually spirits in a loop? I believe we've pretty much got a 50-50 um, type of haunting situation. That, I believe, is residual. Yes, it goes back to what has happened here due to the tragedy. Yes, it's in this blood-soaked ground. Again, we still have these men here. Mm. But we also have intelligent hauntings. It is not unusual at all for our spirits to interact with people. Like you being a reenactor, no. They particularly love the anniversary weekends or Remembrance Day. Reenactors have a lot of strange tales to tell. Um, they will meet someone sometimes. They will be handed something. It'll be an original bullet, a belt buckle. I mean, there are countless stories. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, that soldier disappears into thin air. Right. How about also, you, touching. It is so common to be touched here. We experience that often in our houses. But guests or visitors tell us they're touched all over the place. You can be in town. So this is and where we're getting at right now. Tap you. You turn. How do you get? In, how do you get involved with uh, Jenny Wade House? They talk to people. Church. Not unusual. It's me eight times. Yes. Jenny Wade House. What is that? Really? She's gonna explain that right now. So, uh, Christina, okay. what, is, what is Jenny, Jenny Wade? Jenny Wade was the only civilian to be killed during the Battle of Gettysburg. She's going to be killed at a house that is probably a minute and a half walk from where I am seated. That is one of the houses that we use for our tours. The significant. Yeah, you're, you're freezing up, Christina. I don't know how, how your Wi Fi connection is over there. Did not live in this house. Her. Georgia, one of the portions of the house. It was a duplex at the time. Jenny will leave she and her mother's house to seek safety because the Confederate Army had taken over the town of Gettysburg. Why they did that? Yeah, she's freezing up. Yeah, I think we got it. Was and it, the story's getting good. Was that a spring <laughs> well, well, I'm, we I'm, I'm sorry, Chris. We we lost you. Uh, we lost connection with you. I, I don't know if we have a bad connection with you. At, uh, oh, okay. I think I think you're back up now. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think you're back up now. Take it from when the bullet hit the front door. Yes. What's going to happen? Jenny is baking bread. Or she is making dough that will be baked into bread for the soldiers that are brave enough to come to that door because they're hot, hungry, and tired. It's the morning of the third. And here's what makes it really ironic. Jenny is going to wake up that morning and do what she does every morning. She's going to read from the scriptures. This morning's reading was very different. It's about death and sorrow. Mm -hmm. Her sister, who is bedridden because she's just had her first child, is going to yell from her bed, Mama, make her stop because Jenny's mother was there assisting her with making the bread and biscuits. Mm. Jenny is going to stop. She's going to walk in and say these very words to her sister. If anyone 
is to be killed in this house today. I hope it is me because Georgia, you've got that little baby. She mm, will walk around. Wow. Yes. She's going to walk around an interior door that her mother placed in that position, thinking it would keep her daughter safe. Mm -hmm. Approximately 830 on the morning of July 3rd. One of the sharpshooter's bullets is going to enter the main door to the house. It will go through the interior door. It's going to hit Jenny under her left shoulder blade, pierce her heart. Wow. Wow, man. She froze again. Kill her. Jenny, so duck. That is the significance of this house. I'm getting into the story. So she was 20 years old. You this is what has created the hauntings. Um, the Jenny Wade house because of the history and she might not be picking us up either. Yeah. How old was Jenny when she what? died? I think she lost her. Yeah, we lost her. She's got I think she said she was 20. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, 20. yeah she was 20. Yeah, uh, we're losing you, Christine. You're freezing up. I don't know if you can us. Maybe, uh, let's do you want to send her see if we can get her back in here? Maybe, um. Uh, have her leave and then uh, well, let's see. Let me try this. It's 8 40 something. Oh, we lost her. Oh, right, did we lose her? Yeah. Uh, yeah. we did. We, we lost Christina. Well, we, I lost, mean, we lost Christina. Uh, uh we'll see if connection. we can, we'll see if we can get her back if you just resend her the link, yeah, or she can go back to her email. Yeah, uh, and, Christina, uh, if uh, I'm sure they could hear us missing, maybe she uh, let's see, at the stage. There she goes. How are you doing? Can you hear us now? Yes, I can. Okay. Yeah, we lost it. Goes back. So, yeah, I think uh, I think we we got what you said that she she died at the age of uh, of twenty, correct? Correct. She'll be dead at the age of twenty okay. on that kitchen floor. Um, soldiers wind up bursting through the door because her sister becomes absolutely hysterical. They decide that they've got to get the rest of the family out of the house or this will not be the only casualty. They will mm -hmm. indeed get the rest of the family to safety and take Jenny's body to the other side of the house. Take her down into the cellar where the family will spend a heart-wrenching 18 hours with her body. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. That, is, that, is, that is so. What wild. what can what can people expect uh, going on one of the um, uh, Getty images of like ghostly Getty, images of ghostly them. images of uh, Gettysburg tours? Well, we actually offer a variety. Um, we do tours of the Jenny Wade House, mm -hmm. also of the Homestead Orphanage which was under the control of the evil headmistress Rosa Carmichael, yeah. where it is said she chained children, the smallest of children, in what is known as the pit or the dungeon. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. do have letters and some memoirs telling us, yes, that was indeed truth. So you can tour either of those separately or... Thomas you took operate us tour in the dark right. through both houses. You have 45 minutes in each house. And uh, we were there uh, last week and uh, we had a chance to investigate the Jenny Wade house and the orphanage for a little bit. And for the amount of time that we were there, we were getting some pretty good activity in both locations. Right. It was Absolutely. Fun. Our guests. Sure. Um, experience things, you know, of course we have a lot of skeptics. They come to do these tours for entertainment purposes. They leave as believers. Mm -hmm. Well, the when smells, we left, um, when we Jenny Wade house, can't tell you how many times people have entered that front door and said, where are the flowers? This place this smells, we're overcome with it. There's not a live flower in the whole place. 
Um, mm. Voices are very common. Wow. Well, when we were leaving the, the second floor of the Jenny Wade house, um, uh, Dan and I on his machine, you could hear Dan and then Wade, don't leave, don't leave, stay. You know, I mean, how do you dispute that? And that was Billy, by the way, the young boy. Yeah, that sounded like it was Billy. Yeah. Right. right. And then, I, you know, that was after I turned the speaker on and made Wade jump. Okay, enough. <laughs> but the, the, the interesting part, before Billy said don't leave, there was a big bang from oh, the yeah. first level. Yes. Downstairs, yeah. and it was by a male figure, an adult male figure. And he was angry with what, what the questioning was going towards upstairs. And he wanted it to stop. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Who is Billy? Billy's, uh, who, the, can you explain who Billy is, Christina? We're not really sure. He is in one of the upstairs bedrooms mm -hmm. on the McLean side of the house. Georgia's side, Georgia was McClellan at the, she was married. Mm -hmm. He is a very mischievous spirit. Mm. He seems to be very happy there. And Another myth I like to dispel, people think that you will stay in a place in the afterlife for only tragic reasons. It's not the case. This may have been the happiest place this child ever knew. Sure. That's right. I think wow. he's about six years old. He loves to touch our guests. I learned quite by accident. If I took something as simple as a K2 meter in, just one night I was carrying it through the house, it lights up. No elect, I mean, you have some lighting, but the areas where it lights up, there is no reason whatsoever. Mm. And so, Christina, again, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Um, how do people get in touch with you to do the ghost tours and What's the buzz going around town about the Warren Secrets of the Supernatural Paracon coming to town? Uh, we are so, Gettysburg is absolutely thrilled to have a Paracon of this magnitude. And it's long overdue, as I told you, Dan. It is time. Gettysburg is becoming known as pretty much the paranormal capital of the United States. So we cannot thank you enough for bringing the Warren legacy and of course, Annabelle and all of the oh, she's, she's breaking up. Yeah. Yeah. Breaking up After, we're, we're, we're excited. To um, come the down. town is very excited as so well we. as I'm sure all over. You will bring people literally from all over the United States. Yeah, and we got some uh, great celebrities. Actually, today we just announced another uh, celebrity that will be attending the Paracon is Mark Pellegrino from uh, Supernatural. He plays Lucifer Whoa. on Supernatural, the TV series. Who else we got, Dan? Uh, we have uh, Jim Beaver. Jim Beaver is from uh, Supernatural as well. That's, That's Bobby. Bobby. We have Bonnie, Aaron, Bonnie, too. Bonnie Aaron's she played the uh, nun. She the played nun. the nun in the uh, the Conjuring series of movies. There, who else? Um, Chad Salick and Ryan Buell from Paranormal State. Um, Chad hasn't been around for a while, so we're real excited. Oh, to we're thrilled him. to have Chad the, um, yeah. this year, and, 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 to and, and to join him up with um, Ryan with Ryan again. Yeah. Um, that's going to be big. I think this is the first time they're appearing together since uh, in years. I think Christina um, dropped off again. Let's see. If she's yeah, we, to, um, how about uh, we lost Steve, Christina again? Uh, but I'll, we'll take care of that. I'll take care of that. Keep talking. Steve Gonzalez. Yeah. Gonzalez. We have Gonzalez's his name. Steve. How do you say his last name? Steve? Right. Steve Gonzalez. He's going to be there yeah, from uh, from Ghost Hunters. And, uh, oh, how do people I contact me? Right here. You got Steve's book. Yeah, I, I remember seeing that. That's right. Good, yeah, good. He's, he's going to be there. It's a great book. Now you're coming to the Paracon, right, Christina? You're coming? Uh, yeah, she's got a table. Absolutely. Got a table. One yeah, of your vendors. There. Good. And we are reaching out to everyone that we know I think, I, and talking about it on our tours. We are so I think thrilled. you should park one of your big uh, double-decker buses right out front. 
That's what I do. <laughs> Uh, you know, we can arrange that, I'm sure. I think and these guys. are now all over Gettysburg. We are oh, thrilled. The posters. Nice. The posters. Oh, nice. Beautiful. Nice. oh, good, good, good. Last weekend. And Christina, we also, we need to talk about um, a special investigation and uh, tours of the Jenny Wade house and the orphanage during our time down in Gettysburg. So, We'll talk a little bit more about that and uh, make this a little bit, you know, more for our, you know, people to do around Gettysburg, like uh, haunted locations to investigate. That sounds great. We would be delighted. Now, do you make reservations for this kind of stuff? Yeah. How do we, um, how do we contact or how do our uh, ticket holders get a hold of you? I'll tell you what we will do, Dan. Let we will talk and set up a special time and give them a special rate that okay. we can bring them in to do an investigation or tours. All right, that sounds really good, and I, yes. I'm sure they, they, they will appreciate that. Hi, Cop. And uh, the more we could do uh, to uh, get business into the uh, local area, um, that's what we want to do. Greatly appreciate it. And the more we can do to help you and to thank you for bringing yeah, we, this event to us. We look forward to, uh, if you wait, 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 wait. Hold so on, the children are acting up again. Well, what happened to us? Yeah. They're really close to together. Yeah, put your hands on the table. No, <laughs> there will be no touching. And crazy, I had a gentleman just say hi to me. So I <laughs> Go ahead, go ahead. Dan got go ahead. I'm, Tony got a little flustered. I got a little flustered. <laughs> he got a little fair. A quick question for you, Christina. Yes. Have you had any personal experience down there as in hauntings? Personal. Um, I'm gonna admit something to you, Rick. Yeah. I was a skeptic for many years. No longer. Mm. I always look for the scientific reason. I'm one of those horrible people that likes to debunk things. That's me. <laughs> Absolutely not. Well, you have um, to. Let me change. tell you my most famous. Go ahead. This happened last June. In the orphanage, they had done some remodeling. It was the winter before. They took down six layers of plaster to uncover the original brick and the window frames in the dining room of the orphanage. There were some antique pieces on the wall. So I put them in my office thinking that they could be used elsewhere. The manager of the Jenny Wade house said, Hey, Christina, do you have something that would look good in one of the upper bedrooms? I said, I've got just the thing. It's a picture of Christ the Redeemer in a burl wood frame it's of the time period put it up on a friday afternoon myself it's on a spike not on a little nail i have a tour group that night i'm standing there talking jesus is on my right side maybe a foot and a half away suddenly the picture didn't fall it shot off the wall, arced up over me, landed on the other side of a lady that was on my tour. Wow. It came off with such force. There's a candle holder and a rather tall taper candle. I look down, it's between my boots. Wow. Well, that was it for me. Everybody thinks. It would be really amazing to have a paranormal experience such as that yeah. until you actually have it. I was very it. useless. My was, was, was that in the orphanage? Was that in the orphanage? Or Jenny Wade? Jenny Wade. Jenny um, Wade. So yes. think, That's what, do you think right. that was an evil no. entity or just oh. some a poltergeist maybe messing around with you? That's Here's odd. what we know. Uh, the year before... We had done some work in the Jenny Wade house. It was extremely active. The theory is, remember, they believe this is their house, not right. ours. Right. 
They don't like changes. Right. You're right. Correct. It hasn't happened since. Thank goodness. It, it, it's a little um, disconcerting when Jesus arcs off the wall. Right. Yeah. I think it was Wade, something new and they didn't like it being there. Wade, Wade was sensing something uh, before we got there. And it was interesting that you mentioned that because he at was the, mentioned at the, orphanage. at the orphanage of something about a pentagram or something that was on one of the plaster walls. Painted brown and it, it was painted over, painted over, painted over. And it really, it didn't really, you could still see a shadow of it underneath. And I'm just wondering when you mentioned about the plaster walls being taken down, the six layers, I'm just wondering if, if in the dining room area between the two windows, was that there? Do you know anything about that? I do not. And that's, that's mm -hmm. yeah, that's very strange. Because I can even tell it was brown. Oh, you we we're talking 150 years of yes, history. That's yeah. odd. Bring to today. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, but but this, was, this was done during the like um 30s or okay. 40s. It wasn't during the, after the Civil War. It was done, it was done like the 1940s, 1945, 47. Huh. Um, yeah, yeah. Wait, wait is wait is psychic. Um well, so he picks up on, on these things and um he blows my mind away sometimes when he uh we find out that you know what he was talking about really did happen at that location. If, anyway, do you know if have you ever heard of that before? No. Okay. This and now you have me curious because we've never seen it. Um well, I think through all the construction on the property, um, the walls, different walls being put up right. and walls well, taken down. Um Things have moved around in the house, but yeah. the energy, I'm sure, is probably still there. But for 150 years, like, okay, we'll do the orphanage. What was that throughout history after the Civil War? Was it always an empty building, or was now, it anything else? It will become a variety of things. Um, it yeah. was private residence. Okay. Um, I believe at one time they rented rooms. But here's your fun fact. Somebody you might have heard of will buy it in 1959. His Christian name is Cliff Arquette. And you know his grandchildren in Hollywood, um, Roseanne and David. Yeah. Mm -hmm. he, none other. Oh, excuse me, Patricia. It is none other than Charlie Weaver himself, Cliff Charlie Arquette. Weaver? Of right. the Hollywood Square Spain. We know, I know Charlie. So there was a history. He will turn that into the uh, Soldiers yeah. Museum. Oh, no, I remember Charlie Weaver. Yeah. Yes. He lived above the um, orphanage. That was his residence. So mm -hmm. he will operate that. I believe it closed in the hmm, late 70s. His collection will be sold off. He was a huge history buff. You know, so, uh, people saying anything about hauntings throughout those years, like in the orphanage, like people. Yes, in yes, the indeed. Um, they did experience many, many things. Now, Charlie wasn't so prone to talk about it, but yes, mm -hmm. it has always been known for the paranormal activity. So, so Christina, um, your tours and everything, because uh, we're going to close it out in a little bit, but um, who helps you with your tours? Because Tom was there with us. Tom Demko? Demko. Demko. Tom Demko. He is actually sitting right here. He he likes to be called my aide de camp and not assistant. But yes, Tom is one of our tour guides. And yes, he does live above the orphanage. Hey, Tom, um, Tom where are you? Come in front of the camera, Tom. Come on, Tom. Tom. Oh, all right. right. I'll get in here a little bit. Oh, yeah. Oh. Hey, Tom. Hi, guys. Good to see you again. Tony, hey, Tom. Tom. Miss you. Tom, where are you, hey, guys. These two, these two yeah, people are, hey, Tom. just have so much knowledge about those oh, two buildings. Oh, well, and, and of Gettysburg. It's, it's amazing. Incredible. Right. Yeah, it really is. Well, yeah. It's very active. I'm very respectful of the spirits, but I've had a lot of things happen in my apartment right to this very day. Yes. And, uh, yeah. 
it's very cool and I, I enjoy living there, living amongst the history and the spirits and yeah, and right. I share my experiences on our tours every time I give a tour. So yeah, it's Tom, really Tom's cool. A cool guy. You're a TikToker. Uh, well, right. it was great meeting you guys. I think I said when we were live that I felt like I knew you guys for 20 years after just spending yeah, you know, a little right. time with you. So yeah, it was awesome. Look forward Tom. to you guys coming back. Oh, we can't wait yeah. till you Tom, come back. Tom, you're on uh, TikTok. Why, why don't you tell uh, tell everybody what your uh, TikTok? Yeah, is. sure. I, uh, I manage at 65 years old. I became the manager of our TikTok site, Ghostly Images Gettysburg, and we're actually live right now. On TikTok, oh, and we go live time to time from the houses. I do clips. Didn't you get the like the most? And... Didn't you get like the most views from walking home from the bar? I do my best <laughs> wives when I'm half in the bag, as I say. Yeah. But, you know, uh, did you remember? Do you remember walking home? I do. Yes, I always do. Okay, I just want to make sure yes. if you get the most <laughs> views, if uh, you know you did something. <laughs> Yeah, no, nah, I don't. I'm always very cautious. Of <laughs> I have a lot of fun. A lot of people watching. And we're certainly promoting the Paracon every chance we get. So. Getty's uh, work is very safe. safe. And actually, the night, we were, the night, we were, um, the night yes. we were filming you guys was the largest live we had so far. So oh, really? Fun. Thank you. Oh, cool. Thank you. That's awesome. So anyway, I'm going to step well, out of the out. shot, but nice seeing you guys. Nice to meet yeah. you, Tony. Thank and, you very uh, much. Look forward to yeah, it. You guys love you. All right. So I think we're going to end it, but uh, we're going to have you guys on, I think, again before we have our Paracon. Yeah, we'll check it out. We're yeah, going to promote uh, your Gettysburg tours, of course. You very guys are very pleasant to speak to, to be yeah. with. Yeah. And, and having you on the show. All that knowledge that you guys have about Gettysburg, which is fascinating. And I also want to just say that when we go down there, and you know, we're going to show a lot of reverence towards what happened there because what did happen there was so brutal and so tragic. People don't even think about stuff like that today, but can you imagine losing 52,000 men in three days? 52,000 men is a lot. Most cities in most That's towns like, in the U.S. is less than yeah. And it's, like, it's like where we are right here in Monroe, there's only 26,000 people. It's been like that for yeah. 50 years. Like it was for a reason. It was a and, cause. And it was a cause that men fought and bled and died for and you know we 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 have to keep them in our thoughts yeah and as the next military uh guy um i remember you know going to gettysburg and uh waking up at five o'clock in the morning as soon as the sun starts rising and walking in the cemetery and there's nobody around it's just me and the headstones here and the soldiers that have fallen and um you really appreciate it you know what they gave what mm -hmm. they yeah gave what up. they gave to this country and a lot of people don't you know really you know give them that credit that you know our freedoms are from them those are the heroes right. not not the singers and the idols and the movie stars those aren't those aren't right. heroes the heroes are buried in gettysburg and other places right we hey, want to, we want to re remember them too yeah so. paid that's, in that's blood cool. that's cool absolutely and i have to share this Looked out the window today, and Tom was here. We were preparing for this podcast. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, we see, I, I don't know how many, tons of young men and women in um, military. their military That's gear. Nice. So we went running. And of course, it's raining, you know. Can you see us running out here to the battlefield? Ended up being West Point cadets. Oh, so we have pictures beautiful. on our Facebook page, um, Gettysburg Battlefield Tours. If you'd like yeah. to see that. It was truly a thrill to right. see West Point here. Right. I remember sitting in your office and the window, the shade was open. And it's like six. Uh, the wind is blowing like six, 60 miles per hour. And then we see Wade walking into the cemetery, <laughs> and up the, up the hill, <laughs> six miles <laughs> He sent me video, and all you can hear is the wind. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, please come back soon. All of you are welcome. Take you for a good dinner, and okay. oh, all right, we're gonna pay. We're there then. Yeah, we're, we're there. Next oh, week. We're there, there. 
next week we'll be there. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so, that would be great. We, we really appreciate and Tony, it. please, can all of you, Rick, oh, Wade, thank you. Wade. We need everybody. We'll be down there to see you guys. But we really, really appreciate all your knowledge, all your your friendliness, and your your uh, patience with us. And I can't wait to meet you guys too. And uh, we're gonna have a great Paracon, and yes. we're involved. And we're gonna have you on again because you're such a, a knowledgeable and great guest too. All right. Thank you, truly. So, and oh. the group that I'm sure all the audience loved it too. All right, Christina. Hey, uh, we'll talk to you soon. All right, and thanks for coming on to our podcast. Okay, Dan, you guys and take for, care. For Christine, who was it? Well, another? And Tom. Oh, Tom Demen uh, Demko. Demko. Tom Whatever Demko. his name is. Are we in the oh, room? and by We're the way, yeah. yes, wait, wait, wait. One, one more thing. thing. Well, we're, this is it for Christina. Oh, I know, but she has one more thing to say. Go ahead, Christina. Gentlemen, yes. sweet dreams. All right, <laughs> 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 I right, love, love you. We'll love talk soon. Bye. Good night. Good night. Yeah, what I want to do is uh, we got maybe a couple more minutes, and uh, from our last show, I know, like I said, we're talking about Lorraine, and yesterday was our anniversary of her passing. Right. But last show, you started talking about, and we never got into it, and I want to get into it, is how Ed and Lorraine met, and you started talking about that how Ed went into the Navy, right. and, and everything, you know, and right. it's actually, you know, it's pretty cool because Ed was a Navy veteran. Yep. during world war ii you know and, and it's great to bring this down to gettysburg very proud of what part of that history and was very proud of being a, a navy veteran in world war ii he joined the navy on his 17th birthday september 7th 1943. he initially joined the marine corps then the marine corps said hey wait a minute you're only 16. uh we got we're not you can't we, they, they kicked him out in other words he wasn't old enough somehow he convinced the navy on his 70th birthday that with his parents' signature, and he joined. But he met Lorraine prior to entering. He was an usher in a movie theater in Bridgeport, Connecticut, called the Colonial Theater. And Lorraine was with three, two friends of hers, said, Lorraine, let's go to the movies. And by the way, there's a boy we want you to meet there. And Lorraine told me later, she was, I wasn't into boys. I was into studying and just home life and all that stuff. She was, I really didn't care about meeting anybody. But we get to the movie theater, and all of a sudden, there's this young boy in a, in a nice uniform, sharply dressed, polished shoes, hair combed perfectly. And she goes, she says to me, she goes, and he smelled like Noxzema. <laughs> and so I said to her, why? What do you mean? She goes, well, he was a lifeguard in the summertime. And this was in the summer. And in the daytime, he used to be a lifeguard. He put Noxzema all over his face so he wouldn't get too bad with the sunburns, you know. Yeah. And she said, as soon as I saw him, though, she was, I liked him. And after the show was over, the movie, uh, Ed says to the, all the girls, I'll come on, I'll walk you girls home. And Lorraine, remember, walked to the movie theater with two girls from her house. Then the two girls picked her up and met her. No car. So he's walking them back. And one girl gets to her house. Ed says goodbye. Another girl gets to her house, says goodbye. And now it's just her and Ed. And she says to me, she goes, I couldn't let him drive, walk me all the way to the house because I didn't leave with a boy, so I can't come back with a boy. That's, remember, 1942. Right. So she says, he says, okay, I'll see you later then. But, but first, before he did that, before they left there, they, they went to a malt shop. And the rain <laughs> and the two, three, two girls ordered, he goes, I'll buy you guys a Coke. So the two girls order a Coke. And you know what your Coke was? Five cents each. <laughs> She, they look over at Lorraine. Ed looks over at Lorraine. She goes, I don't like Coke. I'll have an ice cream soda, please. It was 10 cents. It's twice what everybody. So she, Ed always used to make the joke later. You know this, Rick. He used to make the joke later. He says, I, ever since then, I knew she was a gold digger. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> <She> went, <laughs> yeah, so so when, when, when she left, when, when he left, though, when he back, he said, she said he was like walking backwards, like, see you guys, you know, I see you. And she was, he ran across the street. And as he was running across the street, in her mind's eye, because remember, she was psychic, in her mind's eye, she said, I didn't see the young 16-year-old boy, 140 pounds, running across the street. I saw him as I knew him, married, older and grown up, you know, heavier and everything else. She goes, I went home, I opened up my diary, and I wrote in my diary, today I met the boy I'm going to marry. And she did. 
And that was the only boy person she ever dated was at the first date and she married him on survivor's leave. The ship went down February 5th, 1945. Wow. And it was sunk. It sunk. Right. Yeah. And he, there were 69 yes. survivors. He was one of them. Right. And story. he saved a guy's yeah. life named Salazar. Because remember, it was a lifeguard. Mm -hmm. But he's in the South, he's in a, a North Atlantic, February 5th, freezing cold weather with sharks. And he told me, right? Wasn't there? It was fire. Yeah, fire because fire they, they, they yeah. fight it with a tanker. Very telling you this story. And yeah. if you heard Ed tell it, you'd have shivers up and yes. down your spine because he looked at me and he said, Tom, I never thought I was going to make it home that night, that day. I go, What do you mean? He goes, We all jumped into the water. He goes, It was freezing cold, sharks. He goes, And I'm watching guys go down for the last time, two times, three times, they're done. He goes, and a buddy of mine, Salazar, he's having trouble. He got hurt when he jumped <clears> off. He goes, I swam over to this young man. He goes, I swam over to him. I put him in a lifeguard hold. And he goes, I start swimming. He goes, but then I realize I don't know where I'm going because there's nowhere to go. He goes, all I can see is a ring of fire. Fire just licking the whole ocean. He starts to pray. He says, Mother Mary, please help me. Because he always used to. Uh, pray to the Blessed Virgin, yeah. Mother Mary, please help me. I don't want to die. Please help me. As he says that, he said, it was like a freaking miracle. The, the flames parted like this, opened up, and through the flames comes a lifeboat with two sailors on it towards him. So now he's like, ah, I'm saved. I'm saved. The lifeboat pulls up. Ed's in the water. And he says, there's sharks all over the place, freezing cold. He's looking up. He hands off the injured sailor, Salazar, to one of the sailors. They pull him on the boat. The other guy says, let's go. Leave him. We're talking about Ed. Leave him. The tanker's going to blow again. So now Ed says to himself, that's it. I'm dead. I'm, I'm going to die right here. They're not going to take me. The other sailor says, I'll never leave a man in the water. No way. And he grabs Ed's arm, pulls him off to safety. So... When Ed got the survivor's leave, because, you know, they, all the 69 survivors got a survivor's leave, he came home one day on a train, meets Lorraine, marries her right there. The next day, he goes back to the camp. Wow. How, old, uh, how was, old was Ed? Was, Ed was, at that time, it was 1945. He was 18. 18 yeah. years old. I think there's a newspaper article. There is a news. Yeah, there is a newspaper. Uh, the sun, the, uh, the uh, Spring Hill was the name of the boat. Yeah, Spring, Hill. Spring Hill yes. was the name of the boat. You guys can look that up. Uh, now, did he ever hit that survivor again? I don't know. I, he he did. I recall he did, actually. Yeah, years, probably years thanking him. And they ran into by accident, actually. And, and never, never liked to talk too much right. about... And I think he's from Texas. Right? Yeah, he never used to talk too much about what yeah. he did in the war. Yeah. Except I remember when uh, the movie uh, not Platoon, uh, uh, Saving Private Ryan yeah, yes. came out with Steven Spielberg. Yeah. Yes. Ed saw the movie that night, yeah. one night. And the next day, I come over to the house. Ed's talking to me. He starts crying. Yeah. I go, and this is right after. I went, What's the matter? He goes, lost a lot of fucking guys over there. Well, he's like, lost a lot of my friends. It, but yeah. it was too much. When yeah. Ed saw these guys getting torn up and, and ripped up and stuff, you know? Yeah. So, so well, well, listen, guys. Uh, uh, I think um, we're going to wrap it up soon. But thanks for sharing that story, Tony. No, thanks. And uh, Rick, thanks for joining us tonight. Yeah, that was a nice surprise. That was great. Yeah. Awesome. So we're, I mean, at this Paracon. I'll give you 20 bucks later, Rick. Right? At this Paracon, like I said. Wait a minute. <laughs> at this Paracon, is, uh, you know, it's all about uh, dedicating um, Ed and Lorraine's work, I mean, and why we're doing this. And uh, these guys that are sitting in this room has, has a story each to talk about um, what their experiences working with Ed and Lorraine. Um, I never had a chance to work with Ed. I mean, it was just uh, Tony you, you and Lorraine. Experience with Lorraine to know what it was like, though, because she, yeah, Lorraine, was, she worked Lorraine with Spirit. With you. He worked right? with Ed Spirit was with Lorraine. All yeah, time. all the time. Yeah. She loved you, so she knew. Yeah, and yeah. she's still she's still with us. Yes, and Ed's still with us. You remember, like when we yeah. go on investigations, we always get Ed coming through. Uh, yeah. through we uh, always through get equipment. Him. Yeah, they. I was thinking of that. I was thinking of that. Gettysburg, it happened like eight, ten, twelve times. It yeah. came through. Yeah. Wow. And, uh, and, and and every time. I mean, what is it? What is it? I mean, that, but but if it isn't Ed, what what does the spirits pick up of him to say his name literally thirteen times in the orphanage? I I know. I, I think it was that. Just, I think so. Look, we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up. Yeah. So, uh, Tony, can uh, you wrap it up?
I sure will. Look, for Rick Clark, our special guest, for Christine, Christine, how do you say her last name? Rowan. Rowan. Rowan from the Gettysburg, for Dan Rivera, for Chris Galoran, for Wade Kirby. I'm Tony Spera. And Rick Clark. He said, I said Rick. Oh, you did? Okay. I'm Tony <laughs> and Tom. And, and Tom from Tom. Gettysburg. Yeah. Uh, and the audience, we appreciate it. And we'll see you in two weeks. Until then, be kind of Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.